Great. Uh, thank you, Bonnie, for that introduction. And thanks to the rest of you for coming to hear me talk about myself this afternoon. Uh, I promise I'll make it more interesting and less creepy than Clint Eastwood's performance at the Republican convention. Um, I feel like most people probably know me in one way or another, uh, as well as my work at this point. But since I can't be sure, um, and we can't talk about the present and the future without talking about the past a little bit, uh, I'll do my best to get everybody on the same page. Uh, lucky for you, they only gave me an hour this afternoon. The question posed in the, the published description let me turn the text a little bit. in the published description for today's talk goes something like, "How does a young self-supporting artist build a career in, in kiln glass?" Um, the short answer would be by working his butt off and possessing a certain amount of luck. I'm still working on the long answer, but I will attempt to fill you in over the next few slides. All right? I'm willing to take questions. Um, I think it'd be best if we just kind of kept them for the end, though. <clears throat> I attended Southern Illinois University uh, and eventually, eventually received my BFA in glass and ceramics from the School of Art and Design in 2003. At that time, the glass program at SIU was centered around the hot shop. And as we learned to blow glass, my simultaneous experience uh, with the potter's wheel allowed me to quickly become pretty confident with a pipe in my hand. I felt I could make some pretty cool objects, uh, but I was always tied to the bubble as a beginning form. And because everything was hot, all the work was glossy or, or softened. Um, I liked the environment of the hot shop with the heat and the noise and the molten glass and the smoke everywhere. And, swearing and sweating, um, but I definitely spent more time in the ceramic studio. And by the time I finally made it to graduation, I liked to blow glass, but might have liked ceramics more. Um, and then there was this kiln glass thing that was brand new to me at that point. More on that in a second. First, we'll take a look at a few pieces uh, that I don't think anyone has actually seen this side of the Mississippi uh, from my BFA thesis exhibition. I keep reminding myself that I've always actually gone back and forth between making works that sit on a pedestal and hang, or hang on a wall and, and more installation type built pieces. This piece is made up of an individual slabs of fired clay strung together on a metal rod and, and hung from the ceiling. And here's a closer look. and a wall piece from the same show, also made out of clay. Aside from blowing glass and working in the ceramic studio, I was introduced to kiln glass through a series of introduc introductory workshops. This piece on the left, along with the piece on the next slide, is what I would call my first real finished pieces of kiln glass. Prior to this, I had really just been making a mess in the kiln with glass. On the left, you have a simple stack of individual frick cast rings, about seven inches in diameter. Uh, there is a, they are rings, so there is a hole or a column going up the center. And they are all just stacked on top of one another. On the right is a similar piece uh, that was made out of ceramic clay. This is probably, probably my most valuable piece ever, uh, not necessarily monetarily, but in terms of getting me exposure and experience, and ultimately, probably at least partially responsible for getting me where I am today. Uh, you may remember it from Emerge 2003, but it was originally made for my BFA show back at Southern Illinois. And I honestly didn't know, uh, as I mentioned, what I was really doing in the kiln at this point. And I only entered the show on a whim, as I found out about it about a week before the deadline. Um, and I definitely never thought the piece would have been um, so appreciated during that show. After graduation, I worked a number of glass blowing gigs in private studios in the Midwest. I quickly learned that I wasn't really interested in making other people's work uh, better than they could, and realized also that the work coming out of the kiln, which I had continued to drag around with me, um, was much more interesting and personally rewarding 
than anything coming off the end of a blowpipe. Even though I was getting pretty good at blowing glass and still definitely enjoying the hot shop environment. I did, however, manage to put a show together before leaving Wichita. Um, these next two pieces are basically composed of deconstructed bubbles, cut up hot, and then strung onto a wire. Tons of work. Each one of them had a hole drilled in them as well. Tons of work, um, but really not that exciting to me at this point. I was excited about it then, but now that I look back, I almost don't care that much about this work. Um, to give you an idea of scale, these, this piece is about four feet long, and the previous piece was about a foot and a half long. So I enjoy giving presentations like this because it makes me look back at what I've done over the years, and it not only reassures me that I'm actually accomplishing something, uh, but this activity also gives me a chance to compare bodies of work and ask uh, where they came from. So when I look back, I notice the relationships, uh, a strong relationship between my surroundings and the work that was being made. And this continues to this day even. When I was in rural southern Illinois, <clears throat> much of which is actually below sea level, I was surrounded by formations of sedimentary rock and would also often think about the layers of rock and how they were essentially layered records of time. I think you can see the relationship between an area like this um, which is actually Garden of the Gods in southern Illinois, um, and many of the works we have uh, looked at already on the previous slides. When I had finally had enough of production glass blowing, I miraculously landed a job in the research and education department uh, here at Bullseye, and I moved from Wichita, uh, Kansas, to Portland, Oregon. Upon arriving in Portland, I rented a space and set up a studio within a couple of weeks. Um, and in that space, I planned on focusing um, on kiln glass. I, I had an old ceramics kiln with me with a somewhat of a controller attached to it. Um, it certainly isn't ideal uh, looking back at it at this point, but uh, it's, it's all I had, and it was the, the fastest way for me to get working again on my own. So I started out continuing to investigate the ideas that I was interested in during my time at Southern Illinois and, and continued making at least a few pieces um, largely influenced by the rural subterranean uh, environment that surrounded Carbondale. But something had changed. Uh, for the first time in my life, I found myself living in an urban environment. All right, I lived in Wichita prior, but that didn't really seem that urban to me. Um, the, the city and its man-made built environment uh, immediately grabbed my attention. And for some reason that I can't quite explain, I wasn't interested in the obvious um, attention-grabbing natural attractions like the Columbia River Gorge, the Rose Garden, acres of natural parks, hundreds of miles of nearby ocean beaches. And this was strange because I had previously relied on nature for my inspiration, um, but this wasn't the case anymore. I was interested in the tangible, uh, physical aspects of the city, the seemingly accidental arrangements of form color and shape and texture um, were amazing and stimulating like, a, like nothing I had ever seen before. Not quite sure what that is. Everywhere I went, whether I was walking to the corner store or repeatedly making the trip from home to work in my car, my eyes were trained on the elements of the city that sat quietly in the background, often overlooked but deserving of some attention. I began borrowing form, texture, and color from a variety of these sites and started combining them into cast glass forms. And it became obvious to me that the nearly endless examples of structure and form are pretty much everywhere. <clears throat> This new interest in the built environment is not unique in my family, um, and I have to kind of constantly remind myself of this. Uh, my father is an architect, and although for as long as I've been coherent, he's worked on projects designing hospitals, uh, university libraries, um, casinos for the Native American tribes of western New York State, he at one time had a more ambitious, idealistic plan 
um, to design whole cities or at least redesign aging downtown areas of cities. This is an old newspaper clipping that I came across um, a while back um, talking about his plans to revitalize downtown uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Slowly, my work started to resemble various aspects of these new surroundings. I started really paying attention to the structure of the city and started building support into my pieces so that they could stand on their own and display a level of strength and integrity. The previous shot was this piece in the kiln. Uh, this is the finished piece. Slowly, the works became thicker and larger with more complex surfaces. One firing was never enough. Sometimes three to four to five firings were necessary uh, to get the surfaces I wanted. And because the pieces were getting pretty thick and pretty large at that point, uh, this really kind of slows your process down. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a little while. This piece here represents a breakthrough in terms of working methods. If you look towards uh, the lower right corner, you can see uh, a thicker area of glass acting as the base. Um, the added mass and weight here provides the foundation that supports the rest of the piece, which is essentially um, a half inch thick um, elongated facade. And here's a brief tutorial on how I added a foot or foundation that allows that piece to stand. We're not looking at the exact same piece, but I do have a progression of slides um, that will walk you through a, a similar piece. Simply start by making an open-faced mold. You can see the remnants of my modeling material in the background. Um, originally, the model was made out of the pink foam that you see there. The mold was simply poured over the model, and the model was removed, I mean destroyed. After that, fine transparent frit was tightly packed into the opening. It's about an inch thick in this example. And then another open-ended black mold was placed on top of the first mold. And that was packed full of frit. Depending on the kiln I'm firing in, it may be then it then may be necessary to put a lid on top of the frit to protect the top surface from direct exposure to the elements, which usually leads to a kind of burnt crust on top of the piece, with the rest of it looking underfired. This cover that is made from the investment material has the same investment material as the mold makes a good shield and helps <clears throat> even out the temperature so that the frit furthest away from the elements receives the same amount of heat as the frit that is closest to the elements. This approach should result in a nice even application of heat that just centers the small particles of frit together without actually melting them and making them shiny. The few slides we just looked at outlining that process um, were actually the making of the piece on the far left here. And although this is not a close-up of that piece, um, you can get a little bit closer and see how that foot is actually attached to a similar facade. It's all one piece in the end. Working with Frit at low temperatures is something that definitely continues to interest me and something I've been meaning to get back to for a, too long. Um, I love these pieces um, due to the fact they are made of glass, but no one would ever really know it um, unless you were there talking to them. I've had many interactions with people who were very surprised when they actually found out what material was, was used to make this piece in particular. And here are just a few more fairly recent wall pieces that you may not have been able to see elsewhere. Another one here. Here. <clears throat> and here is one of my newest freestanding pieces. We'll see this again in a few slides. So at some point in the last seven years, I found another artist who shared some of my same ideas and also likes to work. And we began talking about making work together. 
I first met Carrie Iverson in one of the first workshops I ever taught here at Bullseye. At that point, she lived in Chicago and had established herself as a talented printmaker and installation artist. So here I was, my first time teaching, and they told me that this famous artist was coming from Chicago to be in my class. Makes you a little nervous. Um, didn't matter in the end. But uh, here are a couple shots of a large installation that she did in the windows of a warehouse print studio uh, in Chicago. The piece dealt with her feelings surrounding the Iraq war and the servicemen and women who died there. This is her installing it. And here it is from the outside of the building at nighttime. Pretty large. It wasn't glass. They were all just transparencies, I believe. Because she was just beginning to investigate kiln glass at that point. Um, but today, she often combines her printmaking heritage with kiln glass processes. And as many of you know, you could actually take a, um, as many of you know, she has since developed a process, a pretty innovative process that allows her to transfer imagery or text to glass from an ordinary black and white printed document. You can take a class with her through Bullseye if you like, as I mentioned. This happens to be one of her newer pieces. It's about the size of a half sheet of glass, if that helps you. The first piece Carrie and I worked on together was exhibited in the Invisible City show at Bullseye and was at the Bullseye Gallery and was titled Synchronicity. There are about 220 five inch by five inch tiles attached to the wooden wall or fence. And the piece was built to resemble a city skyline that was ever changing depending on your perspective. It was also loosely based on the repetitive literary structure that author Italo Calvino had used to write his book, Invisible Cities. The show was actually based on the book and four artists, uh, Richard Parrish, myself, and Carrie Iverson were asked to read the book, interpret the book, and then make work uh, to support your experiences, our experiences. Here's a close up of that wall. To quickly explain the process, we identified a certain number of themes within the book, Invisible Cities, that kept repeating. We made a glass panel, about 17 by 20, to represent each of those themes. And then the panels, or themes, were cut up so we could order each occurrence of the individual themes in the proper location on the wall. Carrie and I decided to continue down this road, and the next chance we had to work together was when I proposed she and I put together an exhibition at Gallery 1-1 at Brazy Street Studios in Cincinnati. The show was titled Tally and was meant to be a collaborative attempt at investigating various systems of recording time and documenting events. This is a piece of carries for the show, glass on the left and slate on the right. In response to the show, someone wrote, Tally stages the objects of time and place, inspired by icons of marking, one's progression through a cityscape, to-do lists, routes, borders, and archaeology. Carrie and Nathan combine kiln-formed glass with concrete, bricks, and stakes to create an installation of consuming flow. Sounds pretty good. Personally, I created this wall piece that the show was named after. Tally was my own personal account of life's repetitive nature. Specifically, I was interested in the number of times I found myself repeating a task as simple as reaching for my keys to run an errand, drive to work, or make an appointment. I used grade stakes, which were routinely used to demarcate fluctuations in elevation on construction sites. For the installation, grade stakes were made of various building materials, including wood, glass, and concrete, were marking the number of times I repeated a simple task over a certain amount of time. While making work for this show, my dedication to glass was actually waning. I wasn't sure why I felt obligated and continue to feel obligated to include it, and I actually ended up using very little glass at all in this show, um, with the exception of a few of those grade stakes in the tally piece. The arrangement of bricks on the floor 
were also mine and were lined up connecting my room with the room that Carrie was in control of. They were actually tracing a route I found myself following daily, sometimes more than once as I moved around the city. And as I mentioned, I was questioning the need to include much glass in this show. Concrete seemed to make more sense, and I had done a little work with concrete and glass before, but really wanted to see how I could directly combine them into the same piece. This piece, titled Frontage, was one of the two pieces in Tally that had cast glass actually embedded in or surrounded by a mass of concrete. So we're looking at the front here. It's about 18 inches by two inches by two and a half inches thick, so that the area that you're seeing as transparent glass is actually two and a half inches of glass going through the whole piece. And this is how it looked from the back in reflected light. <clears throat> So, while all of that was going on, keep in mind that I was working 40 to 50 hours a week here at the factory. Um, when I got to Portland, and by the way, I moved here after being invited or hired by Bullseye, um, I said I would give the job five years. I wasn't sure it was what I wanted to do. I loved making art, I loved glass, um, and I liked working hard, but I wasn't sure I was the right person to be part of a 130-person company. I certainly didn't know how to make an Excel spreadsheet, and definitely didn't know anything about going to meetings or ultimately later, later on writing scripts for videos. Um, I did soon discover that I was pretty good at developing new curriculum, and I really enjoyed teaching the workshops. I've always thought that kiln glass was kind of the next big thing. Uh, glass blowing has had its time in the spotlight, and I really think that works in kiln glass are much more diverse um, and I recognize that there's a great deal of potential surrounding kiln glass as an artistic material and process. Teaching is a way for me to directly influence the path of art glass takes in the future, and to some extent, the record we leave behind as an example for future artists, generations of artists. While teaching for Bullseye, I was fortunate enough to teach in some pretty amazing settings, like the edge of a fjord in Norway, that was about 50 yards from my door. I got to work on some awesome projects that really pushed the material and the methods surrounding kiln glass. I met some really great artists, often from other mediums, and helped them realize their work in glass. From gallery pieces, like this piece um, of work by Lynn Avadenka. She's actually primarily a paper artist. Or, to works that were architectural in scale. This is a privacy screen that was designed by local artists, artist Alex Hirsch, originally commissioned by OHSU and fabricated at Bullseye when the architectural fabrication studio was simply a few tables in an empty room. I look at the panel on the far left and remember cutting all of those pieces of glass by hand, and then I look into architectural, the Archfab space today and see that they have a CNC glass cutter that really would have been handy back then. I've also been involved in helping excite a lifelong glassblower into considering the potential of kiln glass. This is some new work that's been coming out of the studio next door. All of that experience was great, and I'm grateful for the time spent here, and I fully admit that I would not be able to do what I'm about to do um, if I hadn't spent seven years in the department. But I've always been a really independent person and always knew that working for myself or by myself uh, was probably the best situation in the end. As time went on, it became obvious that it, the leap, had to happen sometime. I really wanted some freedom and room to breathe and just be more in control of my own situation on a day-to-day -day basis. Two years after my five, the five-year deadline that I had originally given myself, um, with the econ economy in the tank, I began to negotiate the terms of my release with Ted Sawyer, who is the Director of Research and Education. Uh, given my conscious, conscience and the fact that my name was in print, advertising classes I would teach in six months' time, I really couldn't just simply submit my two weeks' notice and walk away. Plus, I still want to be involved in the greater uh, world of kiln glass that surrounds this place. Eventually, I left a place like this, or like this that we are standing in, to work in a place like this. 
Um, this is my studio in the basement of my house that we bought about four years ago. It's a space measuring about 500 square feet, which isn't 100% ideal, uh, but I do get a lot done. In fact, with only with one small exception, all of the work you've seen on the screen previously today was made in this space. Moving forward, I'm gonna be teaching workshops at many studios in many states and in many countries. It's gonna be a lot of traveling, but while I'm in town, um, Bullseye has offered to continue to hire me on a class-by-class uh, -class basis to teach as a contracting instructor as well. From here, I can develop new curriculum and produce necessary tests and samples. I can continue to make work for shows and galleries. I can pack for classes and shows. I can consult on projects, give lessons, and hopefully get to work with some other local artists from other mediums. As I mentioned, 500 square feet isn't necessarily ideal, but I do get a lot done. I put this in here just so any former students in the room will know that I actually do do what I try to get you to do in class. I'm not just torturing you. Um, this is me hand lapping one of the castings that you saw earlier. Um, and there's a piece of quarter inch float glass on the table with a slurry of silicon carbide between it and my casting. I thought that would be longer. <laughs> and what can't happen underground uh, can usually happen outside. This is my former, uh, my former state of the art cold working studio. And here it is today. Not much has changed, but I still get it done there. I do have a few coworkers to get along with. Sometimes they're impatient, but we do make it work. <laughs> He's famous now. I mentioned, I mentioned working with some local artists. Uh, one example is a project that I'm currently slowly working on um, with an artist that I met when he was my student here at Bullseye a few years ago. He makes, by hand, silver soldered stainless steel bird cages. All right. This one here happens to be nearly four feet tall and is about a foot and a half in diameter, maybe even two feet. I'm working with him actually to start lining the bottoms of these things um, with some pretty classy, elegant uh, glass trays, actually. Um, stay tuned, that, that work is kind of just beginning, but it's interesting. When it comes to continuing to teach and developing curriculum, the broad range of experience I've gained over the past few years has put me in a unique position to actually make a decent living as a touring teacher. It is common for artists to supplement their income from teaching what they do, but I'm hoping teaching can continue to be my income, freeing me from the pressures of absolutely having to sell every piece of work that I make. I'm good at working with the material, and perhaps even better at thinking up new approaches to working with it. I've been doing it for seven years at Bullseye, and I'm pretty much gonna continue to do the exact same thing moving forward from here, which is exploring new working methods and developing new innovative curriculum that I will then present at studios, uh, well, here and elsewhere around the country. There are two workshops that I'm most excited about. One of them is based around using the vitrograph kiln to create decorative canes and marini. While at Bullseye, I spent time developing, I spent time developing the methods and eventually the curriculum. Marini are something I've always admired from a historical glass perspective and aesthetically. Even when I was working in the hot shops, my favorite day of the week was when we would pull, be pulling cane and making Marini. So um, when I got to Bullseye and learned a few things about the vitrograph, it was always kind of in the back of my head to figure out how to use the vitrograph kiln um, in a similar way. And the workshop is exciting because we're, using, we're learning to use the vitrograph kiln in a way I don't believe it has been used before. And as I mentioned, I'm planning on continuing this research and expanding my work and the curriculum with this new technology. A couple pieces made using the vitrograph kiln. A couple pieces made from elements that came from the vitrograph kiln. The other class I'm, exciting ab I'm excited about is a kiln casting class that explores the use of assembled molds to create glass boxes. The good news here 
is that my plan seems to be working. I'm nearly completely booked for 2013 and have already started scheduling workshops in 2014. I'm presenting the boxes and the vitrograph as curriculum, as exciting new curriculum, but the two topics started as areas of serious exploration in my own art making practice. I would like to diversify a bit. I'm not, definitely not known for making small, relatively affordable, semi-decorative objects. Um, I don't want to make loads of them, but I do want to have a few bodies of work, some of which are more accessible, I mean sellable. Um, I am, however, not considering production work, so the pieces would be limited in addition as well as scale. And I have another example of a couple boxes on the table behind me that we can take a look at uh, in a few moments when I'm done talking. As I'm doing all of that, I imagine it will be difficult, if not impossible, to ever stop making works along these lines. Which is fine, because in between teaching gigs, I will use my time to thoughtfully, rather than frantically, propose new work to galleries, group shows, and hopefully um, some private groups as well. I'd really like to get more exposure in more uh, regions and cities. I'm hoping, actually, that by doing more installation type work, excuse me, I can work a bit quicker and the works will be more noticeable due to the increased scale. Uh, making large singular pieces like this piece here, which is actually on the table behind me, um, is a bit slow due to the scale of things. And I really like what happens when, when, he, when many small items come together in one piece. One example of this, <clears throat> is a project that I applied for about a year ago. For those of you who don't know, there's a building called the Portland Building here in town. An interesting historical fact about it is that it is historically relevant because of the controversy the design created. Amongst architects of the time, it was both despised and celebrated. At any rate, the Regional Arts Council operates a space in the lobby of that building that they call the Portland Building Installation Space. As the name implies, it's a gallery space set aside specifically for installation art. Once a year, they accept installation proposals for one month, time, one month slots of time during the coming year. Something like 100 people apply and six get the time and space to exhibit their ideas. They also provide $1,000 to help with material costs. Last year, my proposal was accepted and I will install a second version of the piece we looked at earlier called Tally. The installation will take place next February. So I've actually had over a year to work on this thing and I need to get back into it because I'm almost losing interest. <laughs> I'm interested, but I just haven't had my hands on it in a while. Um, the first time the grade stakes, I'm sorry, the first uh, edition of Tally, uh, the grade stakes were primarily made of wood and concrete. This time I made 36 kiln cast grade stakes um, that will occupy the left side of the wall with the remaining stakes on the right side being made of, of concrete. Like these, only no wood or, or concrete. Starting with a single, single wooden grade stake, um, I made a flexible silicon mold that would allow me to pour 36 wax reproductions of that stake. And then I made 36 molds and then steamed the wax out of 36 molds, cast them all nine at a time, and you are welcome to come up to the front after we are done here and check out a couple um, of the components that are also sitting on the table behind me. But you'll have to wait until February um, to see the finished piece, and I invite you to check out the, the installation space. Um, as an artist, it's something that anybody can apply to, to, get to have some time there, um, and also, it's kind of off the beaten path, so the artists would probably like people to know it's there so they can actually be assured that people are seeing their work. And lastly, I'm also working on a show that consists of many yellow glass objects. I have the opportunity to be an artist in residence at Brazy Street Studios in Cincinnati, Ohio next year and have plans to hopefully use their kilns to make as many two-foot-tall yellow glass objects kiln cast objects that will occupy a gallery space 
uh, somewhere, someday. Wish me luck. And thank you for coming.